to go ahead and get started. So my name is Sheridan Martini, for those of you that don't know me. I'm the IDB project manager. I'm just gonna run through some quick logistics and then I will pass the torch over to Alex who will say hello and welcome and then Bjorn will take the, the front of the leading all the presentations. So really quickly, for those of you that um, are following along on your laptop um, and wanna connect to the internet, our Wi-Fi network is called LJI Guest and the password is institute, all lowercase. Is anybody having problems connecting? Because we did have one issue. You are? Okay, I will run over to you as soon as I'm done and I will see what I can do to help out. Um, in terms of meeting materials, we've shared everything on the Google Drive, so you have both a PowerPoint copy and a PDF copy that you can download. PDF just because that's what the slides are supposed to look like. PowerPoint if you want to take notes as you follow along. Just make sure that you download the files rather than edit them on the drive, because then you're competing with everybody else who's also looking at the slides. Um, in terms of name tags, um, hopefully you got yours when you checked in. To distinguish IEDB team members, our name tags are in blue, so that's how you can kind of track us down easily and identify us if you have questions. As for charging and keeping your electronics powered up, we do have some power strips throughout the room. We can also do charging over lunchtime and breaks and stuff like that. So use it as you need it. If you don't need it, that's awesome. Um, for breaks, uh, there's the little table out there where we had the Einstein's breakfast food. That's where we'll have some snacks. There's also some waters um, right on this counter that you're more than welcome to grab one if you're thirsty at all. Um, and then of course, of utmost importance is the restrooms. They're actually literally on the other side of this wall. So you can go out this door or you can go out this door and just 180, right, essentially. And the bathrooms are right there. And then there's two doors as well to come back in through. Any questions in terms of logistics? Awesome. Alex, you want to take away the rest of the welcome? Sure. <coughs> and <coughs> we have a pack schedule, so I'll be very brief. And uh, first of all, I want to thank Sheridan for uh, all her effort in organizing and the IDB team also put a lot of effort in preparing a uh, presentation and so forth. Uh, and I also want to thank you for coming and for being here and uh, I want to emphasize how these workshops are very important to us because it's a learning opportunity for us to really understand what you want, what you need, what works and what doesn't work. And so is uh, through this workshop and other activities like this that we really can uh, have the opportunity of making the IDB better. So that's really all I have to say. Welcome and Bjorn is gonna take it from here. workshop you're doing like this and they have been proven really valuable for us and hopefully for you as well. Um, I'll start with a very brief overview and that kind of gives you a, a, a taste of the different aspects of what's going to be covered in much more detail later by, by everyone else. So this is going to be a bit rushed um, and then hopefully the detail is going to come later. So what is the IEDB? So we are an NIH funded online resource of experimentally derived epitope information. So um, we cover different types of diseases, allerg allergic diseases, infectious diseases, autoimmune diseases, and also epitopes recognized in the, constant, uh, in the context of transplantation. Notably absent from this at this point is cancer that might actually change going forward. This is purely a funding agency issue, which is cancer obviously is NCI and we are funded by NIA. So at this point, there's over 19,000 articles curated in the IADB, and I'll say a little bit more what that means. And in addition to the curated articles from the literature, we have data submitted to us directly from epitope discovery contracts and other people who have large data sets that are more appropriate for submission to a database than publishing as in, uh, in a journal article. So we cover both humans, primates, and, and mice, and any other hosts that are available. So, so one of the first key concepts that um, we started the IDB with is when we ask different people what is an epitope, people will in different fields potentially have different definitions of what's important about an epitope and what makes something an epitope. And um, 
in order to aggregate that information, what we're really storing is the experiments which define the epitopes. So we're trying to capture how exactly what kind of assay was used, what kind of material was used, what kind of response was measured, and that's what we're putting in the database. And then someone can search essentially by defining what kind of experiments would I want these epitopes to be uh, detected by, and that then gives you the data that you want. So in order to do that, what we are doing here is um, interesting formatting. Um, <clears throat> is translating the kind of data that we're getting in the journal article, so materials in methods sections, uh, figures, and then we transform that into a structured format so that things that are shared between different journal articles and different features of an epitope, such as like what is the species that was immunized in order to get the immune material that it actually gets the epitope, um, is uh, consistently annotated across studies and allows us to query for it. To go into this data structure in a bit more detail, obviously the key for us is, is what is the epitope. And so this will be the material entity that is actually recognized by an immune receptor. So this could be a peptide, this could be discontinuous amino acid residues on a protein surface, this could be a carbohydrate, or essentially any other kind of molecule. Then there must be some kind of information based on which we know that this is an epitope, and this could be a journal article, as I said, or of a submission. And typically, every epitope is associated with a source. So you have a peptide that is derived from a certain protein that is found in a certain organism, and so on. Now, in order to be known to be an epitope, it must be characterized in an assay. So we consider uh, three different types of epitope definition assays, B-cell response assays, T-cell response assays, and MHC binding. MHC binding is obviously not strictly an epitope assay in the sense that uh, the MHC binding doesn't guarantee that the peptide, say, bound to MHC is recognized by T cells, uh, but it's a necessary requirement, so we're storing this information uh, alongside uh, T cell response data. So uh, this data is preceded by, so, so in order to make an assay, you're testing some kind of material. So this could be, you take blood from somebody who had a certain infection, this could be you take spleens from mice that were immunized with a given vaccine, that's the kind of immunization processes that we consider that are then actually giving you the material that you're testing for uh, responses in the assay. So, so all of these things are essentially <coughs> defining the key elements of what we store for a given epitope curated from the literature. For all of these, we're <coughs> using um, formal ontologies that allow us to aggregate this kind of information at different levels of precision and uh, allow kind of to do some assumption queries to get uh, different things back. In terms of metrics, uh, we have at this point, as I said, about 19,000 paper in the IADB. You see here that the papers that are processed, some of them don't have curatable information. These are the ones that actually make it in the database. The vast majority of these are infectious disease papers, then a bit of allergy, a lot of autoimmunity, very few transplant, and then we have other, this is things like naturally eluded ligands or so that are not really coming with the disease state associated with them. At this point, that was at the end of the first uh, um, contract period, we finished historic curation, meaning we went back in time to uh, capture all the papers that had been um, published from the 50s on until then. And at this point, we are in steady state <coughs> where we are aiming to capture every epitope paper that comes out within eight weeks or so of its appearance in PubMed. This is the homepage, which we are trying to optimize over and over to make it as easy as possible to di directly get data out of the IDB. So the key here is this middle part, the search interface. And to just give an example, if I would want to search here for T cell epitopes recognized in Timothy grass allergic humans, I would do this as follows. I say that the source, the antigen from which my epitopes are derived, is Timothy grass, where the Latin name is Freon pretense, and this will autocomplete if you don't know your Latin that well. Um, you can select that the host should be a human, that you're looking for T cell responses. Be capture both that's positive and negative data, so by default, uh, we, this is selected, but you can unselect this and also get peptides back that were tested but weren't uh, recognized. And you say that they were allergic and then search and you're getting these kinds of data back. So um, here you have a summary. This is all the same data, but essentially different views of it. So there's a certain number of epitopes from antigens tested in assays, recognized by immune receptors, and it described in a certain number of references. So the number here always says how many hits you're getting. So in case of the epitopes, in the case of Timothy grass, everything is just peptides. Uh, you get every peptide that was tested and the antigen was derived from. In terms of assays, when you click on that tab, you see here the T cell assay. So you have for 
even assay record, the, the paper, the PEP test that was tested, the, what was the disease state of the person, etc. In this case, it's a proliferation assay, and you have a class two restricted epitope. And for the, the references, these are the four papers that actually match this query from which this information is derived. And here you have an example of a submission that doesn't have a PubMed ID and a paper that actually is uh, linked to the submission. In terms of antigens, these are the proteins from which it's derived. So you're getting here the nine different proteins. And one of the key things that we've worked quite a lot of is that authors tend to use different isoforms of proteins. So um, we are aggregating this information um, essentially using, using ontologies uh, in order to uh, provide a, a more digestible overview of the results. If you click on this um, icon here, this is the immunum browser which displays this information differently. It maps the epitope back to the antigen sequence. And because you have like different variants of peptides tested, you can see now the immediately regions of the protein where most of the reactivity is uh, localized. And if you scroll down here, you get this table of peptides that actually is where this data is coming from for all the different peptides tested by different people. So in terms of submission community, so uh, the IEDB was actually originated, funded in parallel to a set of epitope discovery contracts. It was always the idea that these experimental contracts generate a lot of data and that ends up in the IEDB. And then the switcher configuration was done in addition, essentially to, to fill up these, these gaps. And at this point, there's uh, 10 funded that are dealing with infectious disease B-cell and T-cell epitopes. And, um, one or two, I think, that are dealing with allergy epitopes. Oh, three now, I guess. Um, um, and there have been already 24 uh, completed, and they have led to a, a large volume so, um, of, of epitopes that were uh, in total submitted, uh, and they comprise about a quarter of the data in the IDB. So this would be data that you can't find in the literature that is only in the IDB. In addition to doing all this database work, we're doing uh, what we're doing right here, trying to promote awareness of the IDB and uh, teach people how to use it. Um, so we're organizing this workshop. We also go to uh, conferences and present exhibit booths, uh, try to publish papers to advertise uh, how the IDB can be utilized, and uh, write uh, help tutorials and uh, try to do videos to um, uh, make the site easier to understand. We realize it is still a complex site and it's not trivial to navigate. So coming back to that was kind of the overview of all the IDB functionality that we're covering, again, in much more detail going forward. Um, our goals for this workshop is um, we um, want to use that you guys are here to get your input or to make the IDB better. So, so uh, frank criticism is very welcome. If anything is not clear or so, please ask. So it, it helps us a lot to see what things are obvious and what things are not. Specifically, if you're developing a system like this and then you are designing the web page, for me, everything is super obvious. And then you look at someone struggling to find which button to click, and it's, it's hard to remain like aware of what's easy and what's not. So um, that's also why we have a number of um, feedback -ish, uh, uh, components here. We're asking you to fill out, um, uh, fill, fill out surveys, etc. That'll help us again, like gathering this kind of information. And obviously, we want you to have uh, something from this workshop as well. You should get out the most from the IDB. And uh, for us, again, I mean, this is our goal again, because for us, the best ad, um, metric of success is people using the IDB and saying, "This is something I did, and this is the query I performed, and help me do X, Y, and Z." And if there's a paper coming out of that with a citation of IDB, that's uh, for us a uh, success. And with that, I'm done way before time. I don't know why I spent oh, so much time with this last Can you just ask some questions? Please. So you talked about the cancer just briefly at the beginning. Yeah. Is that in the works? Can you talk about it? So um, we are, so uh, two things. So first of all, um, we are curating currently some, some types of cancer. So the moment it is a papillomavirus induced cancer, it counts as an infectious agent because it's a papillomavirus, so we cure it. So when you go to the IDB, you'll actually see a bunch of this. So also, there's a like 3D structure that is made by a cancer uh, epitope. So we will curate that because the 3D structures are important. If it's binding, they will always curate it. If it's MHC light inclusion, they will curate it. So we are, but um, many things we don't. So unfortunately, right now, if you go in the inquiry, you have this half, half finished stuff. So there is a contract renewal in the works where there's an option to add cancer as the uh, um, for curation, and uh, we would obviously very much hope that that option is going to be executed, and this should be, uh, yeah, I don't know, uh, they are completely at the 
mercy of an age, and if you want that, please tell them that this will be something nice for them to find. Yes? Um, when you curate papers from the literature, do you just take any publication, or is there a standard that you want the yeah. paper to have? So, um, That's sorry? That's in the next one. Randy is covering it, okay, so then she's going to give a much better answer than that. Thank you. And I'll try it. Yes, please. How do you uh, process the research documents to get the info out? Do you use it manually? Guys. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> and, um, so, so there's a, okay, but I'll just briefly, so I we have like a, 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 we do document classification automatically, we've tried knowledge extraction, one of okay. the key issues is that uh, when you do completely automated curation and try to extract the data, that works now really well if you're thinking about aggregate knowledge information to answer a question like does protein A bind protein B, looking at all the literature, that works. Mm -hmm. If you want to know, does this paper very specifically say that protein I binds protein B, what is the assay utilized? kind of doesn't work. Okay. So we haven't, um, because we want to have accuracy at a 99% and up level, uh, knowledge extraction isn't there. Sure. Yes? Yeah, for the four exhibits per year, which kind of <coughs> exhibitions do you have? So, so AI, uh, Quad AI, AI uh, Focus, <coughs> okay, yeah. Okay, uh, okay. Yeah, I you, I'm an HLA person. You just mentioned something just in passing. We'll probably cover this later on. But you mentioned the two-step of binding to the HLA molecule as opposed to it's not necessarily important as an epitope. It, 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 okay. So the classic definition would be that uh, you have an epitope is something that's recognized by a T cell receptor, right? Right. So just saying that this peptide binds an MHC molecule it is, it wouldn't be the classic definition of that this peptide is a T cell epitope, you would say this is an MHC binding peptide. So I was just saying, if as shorthand, you're saying uh, we are an epitope database, and we have, you know, we don't, we don't always want to write epitope or MHC binding peptide or MHC eluded ligand. So so we just say epitope, and it's, it's a little, yeah. And you can always see it. Okay. Thank you.